Welcome to youth group this Wednesday night, and uh, we're going to continue our lesson, our study that we're doing right now on biblical authority and responding to biblical authority. To be honest, as I was thinking about presenting this on the internet, I was a little reluctant to do so because I was thinking about not really having like a group of people that I could talk to and interact with, and, um, and I was kind of thinking, to be honest, that... Uh, you know, we really live in a society that is uh, prone to uh, question authority and to disrespect authority. And so I'm thinking, you know, what we're really asking our teenagers at Bible Baptist Church to do when we encourage them to follow after biblical authority and to respect authority um, and to uh, have faith in God uh, whatever kind of authority that they're placed under, is that we're asking our teenagers at Bible Baptist Church to swim upstream against culture. And even though authority is not very popular these days, um, and, and disrespect is kind of at an all-time high, and, and uh, we see uh, the, the climate of culture, in reality, what it means to be a Christian is to swim against the stream of culture. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 say that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So, um, so I really present this unapologetically, that um, this, sure, yes, this is something that's different than what you're going to get uh, when you're watching the news and those people are disrespecting um, our president and disrespecting uh, people who are in authority and, and uh, questioning everything that is, is passed down. So uh, I want us to think about that from a biblical perspective. So remember that we talked about Romans chapter number 13 uh, a few weeks ago, Romans 13, and we learned from that passage that there are some biblical principles of authority. Why does God establish authority? And what? why is it in any interest of yours to even follow? authority figures that have been given to you anyway. So here are the three reasons. First of all, we learned that there is a progression of authority. That there's a progression of authority. And uh, that the progression with authority is that uh, learning to follow authority, whether you agree or whether you would disagree, is going to help you to grow. First of all, if you learn to follow the authority that you agree with, when, uh, when the authority is right and the authority is, is servant-hearted and has your best interest in mind, then that authority figure in your life is going to be focused on helping you to grow and to progress in your life. And so that's progression, and that's positive progression. I want to tell you that we all realize that there are authority figures that we oftentimes have to follow, whether it's a boss, whether it's a teacher, whether it could sometimes even be a parent or a relative who's placed an authority over us who doesn't have our best interest in mind. And so what are we supposed to do with that? Well, I want to tell you that adverse circumstances will cause you to grow when you learn to do the right thing, especially when it's hard. And doing the right thing when it's hard will cause you to grow. And so there is a progression of authority or a progression in your life even when there's negative authority. So if there's positive authority, they're going to cause you to progress in a positive way because that's what they're committed to. But if there is negative authority, uh, then they're going to cause you to progress when you make the decision that you're going to do the right thing even when you are placed in adverse circumstances. So progression. The next thing is protection. There's protection under authority as well. And uh, we kind of gave the illustration of some umbrellas and uh, some rain is coming down and here's an umbrella that's under another umbrella. If you're under the umbrella, then you have some protection. And here's what I've told you over and over again is that God knows which parents he gave to you. God knows where he placed you. God has not lost your address. He has not forgotten your name. He knows who you are and he knows where you are. And if you have an authority in your life that is hard to follow, um, as long as they're not asking you to do things that are against God's 
commands are hurtful to yourself or to others that are um, that violate God's principles that violate God's morality then when you're submitting to that person God's not in heaven thinking oh man I wish I hadn't given them that authority I wish I didn't put that ruler over them I wish I didn't give them that person because remember when Romans 13 was written uh, we're looking at the children of is uh, the uh, God's people the church um, trying to navigate the Roman rule that's been placed over them. And the Romans were immoral people, and their governmental authorities were doing evil, wicked things, and oftentimes even persecuting believers. But even in spite of that, they were encouraged to submit, because in that case, it even says that God had ordained that authority. So consider that. that there is protection in following authority. Remember the accountability that God gave was to those who are placed in authority. So when Eve sinned, God first went to Adam. When the children of Israel sinned, uh, God first went to Aaron. Um, and uh, we find that when the children of Israel uh, sinned, that God held Saul accountable for their decision. And, uh, and so we see that. Then there's direction. There's direction with authority. And uh, that is that um, when we have a multitude of counselors in our lives, then there can be safety for us. And uh, so not only is there protection regarding the authority, but there can be some help and protection regarding the decisions that we make as well. So three reasons for authority. Then last week we came together and we talked about development under authority. If it's abnormal, we the stages of rebellion. So stages of rebellion, the, first of all, rebellion can begin in our hearts when there's, first of all, a misunderstanding that results in a wounded spirit. Remember last week, we talked about Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15. The Bible says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So we have to guard our hearts. And we have to be willing to recognize that when we are in a relationship with someone who's an authority, that that is a relationship. And that we have to cultivate some of those similar attitudes that we would have in any relationship. And every relationship must have some level of understanding. We, when someone is an authority over us, we can't assume that they know how we think and feel about uh, the things that we're going through when we don't express those things. So here's a phrase that I use about interpersonal relationships all the time. Never expect what you do not express. And so uh, we can't expect other people who are an authority over us to be mind readers. For example, if a child, uh, their mom and dad uh, are, are um, uh, do something that upsets them, and rather than talking with their parents about it or initiating that conversation, they give their mom and dad the silent treatment or the cold shoulder. And that is just going to cultivate the development of a root of bitterness that continues to sever that relationship. And so whereas you could come back together and whereas you could seek restitution, whereas you could keep the relationship going, sometimes in our wounded spirit, we develop a selfish attitude that cultivates bitterness in our lives. So there's a misunderstanding that results in a wounded spirit. And then the next thing that can happen from there is that it can grow to ungratefulness that becomes withholding affection. Ungratefulness that is withholding affection. So remember what we talked about is uh, that when we develop this wounded spirit, we sometimes neglect to realize all of the good things that that authority figure does in serving us in their position. And we are tempted instead to focus on only the negative patterns and the negative things and the things that disappoint us. So we give up gratitude and we focus on, uh, on our disappointments. And this can continue to deepen that root of bitterness in our hearts. And here's how you correct that. Uh, rather than focusing on this area of disappointment, first of all, uh, seek restitution with that. Try to get that uh, right and seek to forgive when there's a wounded spirit, when somebody who's an authority uh, disappoints you. And then next of all, try to focus on the positive things. 
In any given relationship, there's always, always, always going to be a breakdown in the relationship when we learn to focus on only the negative things. You see, there's nobody who's all wrong always, all the time. Uh, so we need to learn to be merciful and to show compassion and to show gratitude. But should we fail to show that gratitude in our hearts? Should we fail to focus on some of the good things and the things that we appreciate and the ways that that person in authority has served us, then what will result is the withholding of affection, like I talked about earlier, the cold shoulder, the ignoring our parents and things like that, uh, that go on. Um, so then this can further develop to stubbornness, which results in a rejection of authority. And the stubbornness starts out with just doing the bare minimum to get by in obedience to the authority. So rather than doing things with your whole heart, now you're doing them perhaps with a smug attitude. And really, this is such a subtle thing. If you're not careful, all of these are heart attitudes, and you can see how very easily they can start playing out in the way that we interact with other people. It starts coming up to the surface, but that's the way rebellion develops is that it initially starts with a hard attitude. And obedience is learning to do things quickly and sweetly. It, it's, it's learning to obey right away, but also to keep a good attitude about it. But what happens is when we start developing these attitudes and the gratitude dies on our hearts and, uh, and we allow that to start affecting our love toward this particular person and we're seething in bitterness toward whomever it is, then the next thing is going to happen is when they ask us to do stuff, we'll do it, but we're going to do it our way, our time, maybe as slowly as possible, maybe with as much attitude as possible. We're going to stomp and slam the door. I'm doing it. But you're doing it with a stubborn attitude. And then the next thing is that when the stubbornness begins to develop. Now is going to be out, out, open rebellion. So you recall that last week we, we, we um, reviewed the story about Saul in 1 Samuel and how he was disobedient to God. And when he was disobedient to God in his uh, rebellion, initially Saul was developing some of these hard attitudes and then he outwardly disobeyed God by not killing uh, the animals uh, by, by keeping them and then claiming that he was doing it out of sacrifice. And when Samuel confronted him, he said in 1 Samuel 15 and verse number 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. We talked about before when we were studying the life of Saul and David about how that initially to us that might seem like a bit of a stretch. But what we observe is that what started out as just uh, an act of stubbornness, uh, a little discrepancy with obedience over here, literally Saul ended up consorting with witches prior to the time of his death. And so this was not a stretch because it's not always just about what you do in a particular moment, but your life is oftentimes determined by your direction. And what I want you to see as we're studying this is that there's a direction that's being taken in this person's life. You remember the Bible says that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. He didn't start out there, but he ended up there because there was a direction in his life. We need to ponder the path of our feet and consider which way we're going. Because stubbornness then becomes open rebellion. And open rebellion looks like your parents told you to do something and you literally disobey them. You literally outright disrespect them. And I want to tell you that that is um, against God's laws. It's against God's principles. And it comes from these heart attitudes. So if a person had started back here and guarded against that bitterness and uh, tried to cultivate restitution and seek forgiveness, then they would not be here at this point of open rebellion. And a rebellious person is not a person who actually has freedom in their lives. A rebellious person literally is a person who is in bondage. A rebellious person is a person who serves the wrong master. And so who's the master that they're serving? Well, they establish themselves as the authority. So 
open rebellion, but, uh, open rebellion is not just the rejection of authority, it's the establishment of self as the authority. It says, I do not listen to other people whom God has placed over me, but in a lack of faith and in an attitude of selfishness, I only listen to me. Someone has wisely said, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God and pleasing self. And this person has decided that they are going to please self rather than please God and anyone else that God has set up in authority over them. So there's the establishment of self-authority, and then there's going to be the cultivation of wrong friends. So what we learned about last week, you remember, uh, or last time we were together, was that wrong friends is all about the compatibility of rebellion. But what that is, is that there are, uh, you are going to make friends with people who think like you. Well, we tend to surround ourselves with people who have our ideas and our philosophy of living. And so a rebellious person surrounds himself typically with rebellious people. And uh, I gave you the tuning fork uh, illustration. You might remember that. That I said that um, a tuning fork plays one note. And uh, if you hit it on the side of something, the two times vibrate against one another and it creates a sound. And it's almost like that those, uh, that those who hit the tuning fork, they listen for other people who are playing the same frequency, the same note that they are, and there they are together. And uh, when I taught in Christian school, it'd be interesting. First day of school, you could watch, and uh, it was amazing how uh, kids who were new to the school, even if they didn't know any of the other students in the school, managed somehow to find all the people who looked, thought, and had all the same interests that they had. We didn't have to get them together and force them into these groups. They automatically found the groups themselves. And so if you're not careful when you cultivate these attitudes in your heart, then you're going to start surrounding yourselves with people that have those same attitudes. So I wonder, what kind of friends do you have? You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Because uh, we can set our direction but when we start our direction, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And oftentimes when we start walking a direction, then we find other people who are going along that same path with us. And when they're going the same path, the same direction, at the same speed, uh, then we find ourselves in company with those folks. And um, so we want to be careful about that. Uh, I want you to look up Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 19. And uh, the first person who posts that in the comments below gets extra points, okay? So Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 19, post that in the comments below. And what I want you to do in the comments below is I want you to explain to me what Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 19 has to do with uh, our concern for eternity. We should have friends who are concerned with eternity, and uh, so I want you to, uh, to discuss that a little bit in the comments below and tell me what you think about that. Next thing is, I want you to look at this. Not only do wrong friends produce a compatibility of rebellion um, as there's a continued pattern in our lives, um, but there is also that, and I have a different color chalk today, um, that um, number six, there ends up being defensiveness. Defensiveness, because we're focused on the fulfillment of selfish desires. Defensiveness, because we're focused on the fulfillment of selfish desires. Here's what happens in the heart of a rebellious person. That when they have let this misunderstanding cultivate un, uh, ingratitude in their hearts and Stubbornness, and then outward rebellion, and then they start surrounding themselves with their friends. Now they have a support group in their lives of people who are encouraging them to still rebel against authority and still to disrespect uh, the authority that God has set up in their lives and to still not have a submissive spirit and to still have a rebellious attitude. And the result is that now they have... Uh, with this support system, they've fabricated for themselves a basis for disrespecting people. And, uh, and so when they are called out for their disrespect, 
uh, then they continue to multiply that disrespect. When they are called out for their rebellion, then they continue to multiply that rebellion by becoming defensive. Well, who are you to say that to me? And then they start spouting all of the platform that they fabricated as the justification for why they're doing wrong. When in reality, what they really need to do is follow what the scriptures say concerning uh, the way we handle our relationships. They should be handling those biblically by trying to work things out with the person they have a disagreement with. So if they have a defense uh, against that, then it's probably because they have not tried to go and humbly make restitution. If they have a defense in this particular case, uh, then it's probably because they're not trying to submit to authority based on the biblical principles we talked about from Romans 13. Um, and they're focused on fulfilling their own selfish desires. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Everything that is spoken of there in those passages is a list of selfish desires. And, uh, and so we see this person moving on from just having a heart of bitterness to now moving into the works of the flesh, having a malicious spirit, having anger, being defensive, being openly rebellious, um, and, and having those kinds of attitudes that go along with that. Next thing is that we see that there is a condemnation of others. A condemnation of others. And this is um, a deep sense of personal guilt. A deep sense of personal guilt. Here's what happens is that uh, you end up uh, having these attitudes that you've cultivated in your own life and you start projecting things onto other people. Uh, sometimes a rebellious person um, who has a bad attitude looks at another person who's trying to follow the rules and trying to follow an authority figure, uh, trying to have a good attitude and a good spirit. And this person with the rebellious attitude starts looking at that person and condemning them. And they call that person a hypocrite. And they call that person uh, goody two-shoes. And they call that person uh, lots of different names. Well, the real problem is that this person has a sense of uh, perhaps guilt in their own hearts uh, that they're not doing the right thing. So they have to find something wrong with somebody who is trying to do the right thing, who is trying to be their own person, who is trying to be an individual, who is trying to follow authority. This person has to follow everything that their new support group uh, has set up for them. And so uh, they end up pointing their fingers at other people. But the truth is, and I want you to catch this and think about it for a moment. Can you really know the motives of that other person's heart? So if you're the one who's making the condemnatory statements, uh, then who really is the hypocrite? Um, I had a Bible college professor who called it reverse pharisaicalism, uh, where it is that we look at other people and we say, those are a bunch of Pharisees, but we don't know what's really in their hearts. And it could be that some people who are doing right are only doing so outwardly so that they can impress other people. And in that, you may be making a fair assessment. But if you're the one who's making the, uh, who, is, who is trying to judge the heart of another person when you cannot know what is in their heart, then you're wrong for that. And so I wonder if perhaps these things could be a reflection of your own heart attitude. Because you couldn't have a spirit which is congruent with the authority that's over you because you've allowed these other things to build up in your life. Is it possible that now you assume everybody else has that same spirit of rebellion in their hearts, that same level of bitterness, and that the only way that they could uh, be supportive of uh, an authority figure or have a good spirit or a good attitude is because... They're only trying to impress other people and that, um, that their heart is wrong. But since you don't know that, those assessments that you make are actually more condemning of you. The final thing is this. Um, oh, actually, con considering the con condemnation, Romans chapter 2 and verse number 1 says this. 
For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thou thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Basically what we're saying is this. That the, the way that we judge other people is oftentimes more of a reflection of ourselves than it is of them. Romans 2.1 and then, I want you to see this, that finally, uh, it can result in depression. And um, bad thoughts. It does not pay to rebel. Um, in reality, when we choose to do wrong, the Bible says uh, that um, the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And when we choose to go against God's laws, we only prove them when we try to break them. And God warns us about these things because they're hurtful to us. And when we allow bitterness to creep into our hearts, I often say that bitterness is a poison that we swallow, hoping that someone else will die. And a person who continues to swallow that poison eventually becomes overcome by that. They say this, hurting people hurt people. And when we consume toxins, we consume poison.